Welcome everyone to First Thursdays. We are excited uh, for the program today. And uh, again, thank you for joining us. You are at First Thursdays with Sustainable Tulsa. We've got an incredible program and a lot to cover. So we wanna get a quick start here. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, want to uh, thank, um, and you are joining for First Thursday on Lost Species. Also I want to say happy Earth Month. Uh, April 22nd is the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, and so if you're joining any uh, Earth Day events this year, please join those and uh, share those in the chat with everyone to encourage people to, to get out and get connected as it's safe to do. So please share those with us today. Um, before we uh, officially get started, I also just want to say thank you so much uh, for joining us and we hope you're staying healthy and safe and soon uh, that is going to get easier and easier. So uh, we, we look forward to seeing you in person when we can do that. Uh, Megan is going to launch a poll really quickly here. And if you don't mind, take a moment to answer those questions while we begin. It helps us with our programming, programming to make this a better um, program for you. So please take a moment to answer those questions. Um, our team is always working to keep you connected with us online through social media, First Thursdays, B2Bs, Scorecard Workdays, and our Oklahoma Green Living page. And we have an exciting 2021. We've already kicked it off, some great programming, and uh, we're looking to have some uh, outdoor program as uh, later in the year. So socially distance, of course, and, and stay uh, connect with us to learn more about that. I, I do wanna take a moment to thank our first Thursday sponsors uh, that have helped to support this program and why we're able to continue to provide it. So thank you to our lead sponsor, Williams, for your continuous support of First Thursday program. We're honored to, to have your support in this work. Uh, we also would like to thank our neighborhood uh, partners, which are Public Service Company of Oklahoma and PSO's Win Choice program. So thank you to, to both of those programs for assisting in First Thursday, as well as our community advocates, American Waste Control, Cavanta, the Met, one Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Air Assistance, and Tulsa Farmers Market, our newest uh, sponsors. So uh, we are uh, thrilled to, to be able to offer that. Please give them a virtual round of applause and thank them for their support to uh, this program. I also wanna take a moment to thank my board members that are with us today, uh, Richard Cox, Wayne Isaacs, Carolyn Janney, Rick Katarski, Nadia Kirilova, Aaron Larder, Ann Money, Carrie Rowland, and Mike Teague. Um, thank, thank you and, and thank them for their leadership. Uh, they were amazing in 2021, uh, 2020 and have um, uh, just uh, great to work with and I appreciate their leadership. I also wanna thank my team, uh, Megan Hurley, Teresa Kerrigan, Jill Maud, and now our new individual scorecard coordinator, Eric, uh, Erica, Gavula. And so we're excited. She's going to help us kick off our individual scorecard program this year, our pilot. So send her a little note in the chat and welcome her to the community. We're, we're thrilled to be working with her this year. And you may be hearing from her as well as we uh, navigate this new program. Um, also, um, this year, we are um, joining the community to honor lives lost. And Sustainable Tulsa uh, is going to be planting trees to commemorate those lives that were lost during the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, these trees will be planted along the Osage Prairie Trail in North Tulsa. Uh, the tree planting will take place on Friday, April 30th. Up with trees, uh, we're partnering with them to, to be planting and maintaining these mature trees on the site. Uh, Teresa uh, is putting uh, a link in the chat now. Uh, the deadline to let us know you'd like to be a part of this is April 15th, and we've already surpassed our initial goal, which is, which is 10 trees, and so help us double that to 20 trees. You can sponsor a tree uh, for 500, or you can sponsor uh, a, a portion of a tree, a share of a tree. So um, if you want to be a part of this, an important part of our com uh, community healing, and again, it's our honor to be a part of this. Uh, so please, um, uh, contribute today and be a part of that. I also wanted to update you on our business to business case for sustainability series event for April. It's on climate action and uh, join us Thursday, April 29th from eight to 10 for this event. Our panel includes Sharina Perry with Utopia Plastics, uh, Philip Michael Weiner with Recapture 
and Brad Carl, who you're going to hear a little bit uh, today uh, about um, their efforts, but also with uh, Brad Carl's with Nature Conservancy and Mike Teague as our moderator. Uh, Teresa is placing that link, uh, registration link in the chat window now. Uh, great program. Excited to hear about how innovation and, um, and, and ways that we can approach climate action and have these conversations. So please join us for that April 29th uh, event. Uh, our next first Thursday will be Okies for Monarchs. Uh, that'll be held Thursday, March 6th with guest speaker uh, Bonsiel Harmon and Katie Boyer and Rick Katarski will be moderating. Registration is also open today and Teresa will be putting that link in the chat for you now. So a lot coming up uh, to celebrate uh, Earth Month, but also uh, keeping that conversation of sustainability top of mind and active and a community that you can connect with and support you on your journey. Uh, and become a supporter of Sustainable Tulsa. Uh, we have made it easier than ever uh, before. Consider donating just $5 today uh, either a one-time or reoccurring donation to help support our program. See the link, it's in the chat, offer this uh, donation now if you can. Uh, it's Our sponsors have helped to carry this on, but we'd love to hear from our members to let us know that you like what we're doing. And, and just a $5 uh, uh, donation would really make a difference. So um, please join us in that today if you can. Uh, Megan, our March Sustainability Challenge, you wanna talk about that? Absolutely. Thank you, Corey. Uh, so our March Sustainability Challenge is actually still open. Uh, we are asking our friends to send us uh, their Earth appreciation photos. So we have one uh, already, and I'm going to cheat and tell you it's my photo from last <laughs> summer. Uh, this is uh, the Wichita Mountain National Wildlife Refuge. And if you have not been there, it is about four hours from Tulsa. It's located near Lawton, Oklahoma. And it's like a, a, no place I've ever been on the planet. So if you haven't even explored Oklahoma, we're going to be posting a lot of pictures from Oklahoma and our surrounding communities just appreciating mother nature and our planet and what we have to offer. So that is um, our that was our March sustainability challenge. So check back every day. We're going to be posting photos every day for Earth Month of uh, appreciation photos. Uh, so in, if you want to join in on these challenges, if you want to be participating with us uh, in, in sharing those photos, you can join our Facebook group. It's Sustainable Tulsa Action Group. Uh, and Teresa is posting that link in the chat right now. So please join us. We, we talk a lot about gardening, definitely, but there are so many other challenges like uh, reducing waste, reducing dependence on plastics, and other um, action items that are happening around our community. So please join us. And Corey, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Megan. Oh, actually, um, excuse me. I'm so sorry. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> I, forgot. <laughs> I forgot this continues. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Carrie Rowland. Carrie, are you with us this morning? Uh, yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, just a real quick promotion that PSO is doing for our residential customers. You can sign up starting after May 1st to get a tune-up on your HVAC system. So you can see there what we will pay for. So I um, think it'll go a long way to do some spring cleaning. We haven't done a tune-up in about, gosh, it's been at least five years now. So we're due do that for our customers. So if you're interested, please go to check out our website. The only fine print is you have to use one of our service providers. So um, we just do that because we want to ensure you, our customers get a quality product. That so, is, thank great. you. That is awesome. Thank you, uh, Carrie. And Teresa yeah. just put that link in the chat too. So that's fantastic. Thank you, PSO. Okay, and now I move on to Jessica with American Waste Control. Tell us what you have going on. Hi, um, nice to be here and see you guys today. I'm Jessica with American Waste Control, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about Iron Man um, coming to Tulsa. It's going to be here on May 23rd, and we are partnering with the Iron Man group to head up the environmental 
crew and we are going to be um, basically just making sure that it's clean and green and that everything is um, disposed of sustainably and where it needs to go. And we hope that if that's interesting to you, you would come and join us. You can sign up um, on the link here and I'll also put it in the chat. Um, just look for the, any of the spots that have environmental listed in them and that will put you as a part of our team. Um, so we look forward to anybody that wants to come out and help with that. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. And I think Teresa also just put that in the link and in the chat as well. So thank you so much. We're so excited that Ironman is coming to Tulsa this year. I know it was delayed from last year. So uh, things are moving forward again. So awesome. Okay. And Allie from uh, the Met. Hi. Yes. I just wanted to talk about two things today. Really quick. We have a tire and e-waste collection event coming up on Saturday, April 10th. It's kind of in the west side of Tulsa from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So you can see that address there. We're taking up to 10 tires per resident. And then um, we'll also have e-waste recycling. And then our other um, big event we have coming up is the Enviro Expo. It's going to be Wednesday, May 12th from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at Guthrie Green, and it'll uh, coincide with uh, Food Truck Wednesday. So everyone who's in the area, come on down and, and learn about some different uh, sustainable organizations in the Tulsa area. Awesome, and Allie will be there. So we're really Yay. excited. Again, another postponed <laughs> event. So this is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And do I have Vanessa on with us? Yes, I am. Hi. Hey, welcome. Hey. Thank you. I just wanted to tell you guys about the city of Tulsa's virtual creek cleanup. It'll be taking part this month. It's going on for two weeks. That'll be the 10th through the 24th. Our website is up now so you can sign up for a spot that you would like to clean. We have 20 different spots and different watersheds throughout the city. And we have some pretty neat looking t-shirts that are available if you participate in that activity. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And of course the household pollutant collection facility, uh, no appointment needed and it's free to Tulsa residents. And that link is there. I believe Teresa put the link to your event in the chat. So um, very, very- Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Corey, I am now turning it back to over to you. Thank you. Great. I just, I love seeing so many great programs and organizations uh, leading the way here in Tulsa, uh, Tulsa or Oklahoma to make it a, a cleaner, healthier, sustainable community. So thank you for all the work that you all are doing. Um, also, you know, uh, we're about to kick off the presentations. And so if you have questions for our speakers, uh, we'll, we'll share both of their presentations first, and then uh, we'll take questions. Please send your questions to Teresa Kerrigan. Uh, she's there in the chat, and um, we'll try to get as many of those answered today as we can. So we are going to get started. It's my honor to introduce Brad Carl. Uh, Brad has, uh, since December 2019, has worked as the External Affairs and Climate Specialist with Nature Conservancy of Oklahoma, and in the award winner, Brad has worked over the past eight years as a certified broadcast meteorologist and reporter covering severe storms, devastating flooding, extreme weather, and climate issues in Montana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Brad also led an award-winning sustainability team while at Fox 23 News in Tulsa and reduced garbage at about more than 60% in less than two years. That's really an amazing feat, congratulations. And he also helped to develop the Nature Conservancy of Oklahoma's approach to climate messaging and policy and has also uh, successfully lobbied, uh, we were glad to participate in one of these, uh, for conservation issues in Oklahoma uh, with uh, Oklahoma's congressional delegation. So Brad, we are so excited to hear from you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, and yeah, certainly thanks you for, thank you for the invite. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Brad Carl with, with the Nature Conservancy of o Oklahoma, fancy title of External Affairs and Climate Specialist. Great to have all of you here. Um, Corey invited me back. If, if for those of you who were part of our conversation back in November, um, we kind of went through some of the first inklings of our climate uh, session findings. We did listening sessions with all sorts of various groups across 
uh, the state. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Um, but wanted to have me back for, for this April discussion and talk a little bit about kind of where our the progress of our work is to kind of give you all an update as well as connect it to some of our forgotten species uh, within our states so still kind of fitting within that theme. Um, let's just go ahead and, and, and kick this right off. So if you wanna go ahead and progress to the next slide. As far as what we're looking to find, this is a little re review for those of you who weren't part of this before, go ahead and click uh, one more time. Um, so as far as us kind of going through this, um, this whole process of, of figuring out kind of where we're talking about, how we're talking about climate within our state, what we're trying to figure out on our end is, you know, where do we actually agree on climate change? I, I could have a whole laundry list of things where we disagree, but where do we actually agree as Oklahomans on messaging and policies and priorities? What are the common threads that kind of bind all these Oklahoma-based groups together? Um, being part of the Nature Conservancy as a nonpartisan group, um, we kind of feel we have a very unique opportunity to be able to engage on this and bring a lot of different diverse players together so we can get a good idea of what that is. Uh, and thankfully, that was a really successful effort over the course of about 10 months, um, including uh, Sustainable Tulsa, who participated in that amongst many, many other groups that we've talked with over a substantial amount of time. Next slide. So as far as who all we talked to with this, um, to really make sure we were casting it out wide and getting a good idea of kind of where everything was at, um, talked to nearly 200 different individuals from all sorts of different um, entities and organizations and whatnot. So you see kind of looking around the circle there, everyone from broadcast meteorologists to state agencies, um, to some city state government leaders, the oil and gas sector, uh, our own staff and trustees, tribal nations, uh, the renewable energy sector, conservation groups. I mean, you kind of name it, we, we talked to them, um, really tried to get as many as possible to come to the table and talk just to try to get an idea of where it, there actually is kind of agreement between everyone. Um, so those are kind of an idea of who we talked to. Also, an important note there, farmers and ranchers in the ag sector, another very important constituency. So we unfortunately don't have time to go through all those findings today. I'm going to be talking to Sustainable Tulsa um, staff and everything about that over the next um, several weeks or so, kind of presenting them the more detailed findings. I only have 10 minutes today, so we're going to go through a very, very short little version of just a few of our kind of major findings out of this. So bear with me as we go through it, but a few of the important things and we really kind of overall a big point to kind of drive home is when we're talking about climate change, it's all about being local. What is happening in my neighborhood where I live? You know, we, we certainly know uh, ocean levels are creeping up and whatnot, but we're, we don't live on the seashore. So that is less, less of an issue, less resonant there. What is a big issue, and this is something we, we talked about a lot during our, our listening sessions, is drought. Um, drought is a huge, huge, huge issue. We are we are a, a drought state punctuated by periods of heavy rain. That's the way it works. Um, this graphic from our partners over at Climate Central that work with a lot of broadcast meteorologists shows that we are one of three states that based on exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, we, have, we are very vulnerable to drought. Um, so we know that's an issue. We have history of that with the Dust Bowl. Drought's a big, big issue in Oklahoma, and it does have big ties to climate change. Next slide. Other local issues. Let's talk about heavy rainfall. Um, this is a trend going all the way back to 1950 and going all the way dated in 2017, talking just about Tulsa in terms of the number of days where we've had at least half an inch of rainfall, one inch of rainfall, and two inch of rainfall um, within, within Tulsa. This is based on Tulsa's numbers. Um, and so you're noticing, you know, over, over that period of, you know, about 70 years, those numbers have gone up. And you might look at that and say, well, it's only a couple of days, no big deal. But when we're looking at averages over a long period of time, and there's a definite trend though, and all those are going up. So in addition to us having that drought vulnerability, we also have the other issue of having days where we're going to have more periods of heavy rain. Um, so it's it's not one or the other. Some, sometimes you're dealing with both, uh, maybe one one year and one the next year. Uh, having issues with that, certainly Tulsa has very recent memory of that with the devastating 2019 flooding that we saw everywhere of having the you know devastation of heavy rain events and flooding. Next slide. So I said, you know, Oklahoma has always experienced periods of droughts and flood. That 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 is very much within our DNA. But when we're thinking about climate change and local impacts. Um, Climate change does kind of load the dice and make those extremes longer and more frequent, which is something that we need to be aware of. And also just kind of thinking about in terms of our resiliency efforts uh, going forward. How do we adapt to that? How do we make sure that everything's good as we're going forward? 
Another major theme we've kind of pulled out from the, those sessions is that, you know, disasters like that are expensive. Uh, you can look here, this is showing the, the number of billion dollar disasters that Oklahoma has dealt with from weather and climate events going back to the 1980s through 2010s. Uh, and to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, this is, also, this is done in adjusted numbers so that we're comparing 1980s dollars to 2010s, but you notice that trend has gone up. So now when we're down at like 10 or so in the 1980s, 1990s, we've more than tripled that um, going into the 2010s. So it's expensive for us to deal with this. And so this is why we also have to think about adaptation and resiliency in terms of how we you know, deal with climate change going forward as a state. Next slide. Of course, to kind of bring it back to the theme of, of what's going on here with, with forgotten species, and that is very much going to be leading into Christine's discussion that comes after me, let's talk a little bit about these little guys, the American bearing beetles, which are native to Oklahoma and are nature's little undertakers. Next slide. Um, let's also acknowledge too, there's a lot of controversy around these, these little buggers. Um, we do not have the time to get into all the controversy with them, but we do want to highlight the climate impacts of these guys and why they're important. First of all, they are the largest of the carrion beetles, about an inch or so long, and they are one of nature's most efficient little recyclers. Not, you know, we say forgotten species. I wouldn't say they're the sexiest species when we're dealing with, with climate change issues, but they are an important one. Um, and one of their strongholds actually is on one of our own properties, the, the Nature Conservancy's Tall Grass Prairie Preserve. You've been up to that uh, near Pawhuska, seeing our nearly 2,000 bison up there, once in the last uh, largest pieces of untouched prairie land in the world. Really, really cool spot. Um, they used to be in 35 states, that has now gone down to just nine. So they've lost quite a bit of, of their habitat already. Uh, next point. There we go. These guys they do recycle carcasses as small to medium-sized birds and, uh, and mammals. So they are the ones who are actually going and taking that from the surface and they kind of bury it all down. They, they are true to their name. They're the American burying beetle. Um, and that reduces the amount of resources and breeding grounds for flies because extra flies flying around all the place ain't necessarily great for us, um, but also good for, for livestock health. Uh, we don't necessarily want to see a whole lot of that. Farmers and ranchers certainly don't like that. Um, so that's just kind of one benefit of what these guys do, even though they're dealing with carrying and carrying and dead things. Uh, you think, well, I don't want to deal with that. They are providing an important service to us. And next point, and do provide great benefits to soil health and nutrient replenishment. So they are, in addition to, you know, being able to reduce that habitat and green ground for flies are also helping a little bit in terms of soil health and nutrient replenishment as well. Now, these guys are also threatened by local climate change impacts. And what is their sensitivity? What's the thing? Well, they're very sensitive to the air and soil temperature. Um, they will only come out to breed uh, when it's a little bit above 60 degrees, um, but they do have limitations of it. That, that air temperature and that soil temperature can only go so high before they're not able to breathe, breed at all. And that's particularly true at night since these uh, are nocturnal. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does expect within 20 to 40 years, climate change and habitat loss will reduce its, its current range, which has already been severely reduced, by another 60%, probably driving them farther north um, as temperatures are expected to get warmer within our state. So there's just kind of one example of how, you know, climate change does touch down here. It is local. It is not just a coastal thing. It's not just on the other side of the world thing. It is right here within, within our own state uh, with one particular species. Um, Big theme from this, from our findings, has certainly been that the climate change overall can feel too big, too worldly to tackle. It's, it's a huge, huge issue. Um, and so a lot of times, especially when we're listening to national media, there's a lot of talk of sea level rise, you know, polar ice caps melting, hurricane impacts, things like that, uh, which is great. But at the same time, when I'm thinking, you know, what, is it, what really impacts Oklahomans, those things don't necessarily, in an indirect way, sure. But when I'm thinking, I'm trying to talk about this issue, um, that may not be the best way to, to talk about it. It may not resonate as well. Um, and Corey or, or Meg, if you want to click and bring up my little stick figure of this kind of thought of, well, good thing I don't have beachfront property. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not saying that's the right mentality to have, but it is one that you will encounter, you know, quite a bit of, you know, I am going to be focused on where I live, my neighborhood, my city, my town. Um, so talking about local impacts and solution, really, really key when we're discussing climate change within our state. So thinking about things like flooding and droughts that we just talked about in here, um, how local species are going to be impacted, 
public health impacts of that? What does it mean if we have, say, for example, more areas for ticks to expand into, which is very much a threat? Um, having to think about that, having to think about you know, longer mosquito seasons, um, things along those lines, uh, and having more heat for us to deal with or higher humidity. Uh, what can we expect to see in Oklahoma as a result of climate change um, going forward for us? It looks like I cut off my last little point, but you get kind of the idea with that. And so a little stick figure hops in and say, well, sh you know, those really do affect me. Um, things like that. So as we're thinking about walking through climate change, um, think of the things that do impact Oklahomans. You're going to find a lot more resonance that way. So that was very much a little tip of the iceberg, what I'm able to cover, cover with that. I have so much more I could go into, but my own time is limited. Um, I am going to be giving a more detailed conversation at this at the April B2B hosted by Sustainable Tulsa. So I would invite you to come to that. Um, and we may also kind of expand from that and go into a, a deeper dive into uh, our findings from all these various things, as well as um, how to talk climate interstate and have it be a good, productive, and less prickly conversation. So I hope that gives you a good primer. Uh, and thanks again for inviting me to, to give my short little spiel, Corey. Brad, thank you so much. I mean, you really packed in a lot of good information in that uh, short time frame, and we're eager to hear more from you at our upcoming B2B and, and throughout the year. So thank you for the work that you're doing there at Nature Conservancy and your enthusiasm to really uh, get the, the word out and to really share the results that you found. So thank you so much. Uh, for your time today. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Christine Delamore. She is the Senior Animals Editor uh, with the National Geographic. And um, yes, and where she's worked for 14 years, she covers predominantly wildlife conservation, animal behavior, species discoveries, and urban ecology. Her background is in environmental science, and she holds a master's degree in environmental reporting from the University of Colorado. She has reported from all of the continents and visited all 50 states. She's currently working, I love this, on visiting all national parks. That is amazing. Uh, a journalism fellowship in Antarctica uh, led her uh, 2011 book, South Pole. Uh, Della Mort lives in downtown Washington, D.C., their husband and son, and we are just so pleased and honored uh, for you to join us today. Christine, thank you so much. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the uh, species we need to continue to protect and be thinking about. So thank you so much. Thanks, Corey. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good. Great. Well, I am very excited to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, which is wildlife underdogs, as I've termed them. Uh, during my career, I focus a lot on the animals that tend to be under the radar, that don't get a lot of attention from either uh, governments or conservation groups. And I've highlighted them quite often in my work over the years. And as Brad uh, talked about just a few minutes ago, one of these animals that I've uh, covered is the American Bering beetle. You see it on my cover photo there, and uh, it is federally threatened. I know it's a controversial subject, but it was endangered just a few months ago, and now it's been uh, listed as threatened. So just an example of uh, how difficult these situations can be sometimes with the lesser known and lesser appreciated animals. The photographs that I'm going to show you in this presentation are predominantly by Joel Sartori, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a Nebraska-based photographer for Nat Geo, and his focus is the photo arc, and that is an effort to photograph all the captive species around the world in zoos and aquariums and get these beautiful studio-style portraits of these animals um, before many of them go extinct. So he's gotten 11,000 of these species so far, and he's still going. I've worked with him many times on my stories, so I wanted to highlight uh, his photography in my presentation. Before I dive in, um, I often get questions about what's it like to work at Nat Geo? So I thought I'd give a few <laughs> insights into that. You know, uh, people say, are you always climbing Mount Kilimanjaro every other weekend? The last year, no, but people do have very adventurous lives at Nat Geo. Uh, we work in a big campus a few miles, uh, sorry, a few uh, blocks from the White House. And if you're ever in town, I recommend you visit because we've got a fantastic museum. We have an entire section on Nat Geo's history, including the first ever magazine published in the 1800s. 
And uh, it's a really exciting place just to be, to, to see all the writers and editors at work. Uh, my work is predominantly working for the website, but I also do work for the magazine. And we have five subject areas. So we have animals, environment, science, travel, and cultural and history. And my specialty is wildlife. And I've been very fortunate to have reported from all seven continents for National Geographic. I uh, went to South Africa, believe it or not, to report on parrots, which you wouldn't expect as a, a country that has parrots. But continuing with the theme of today, uh, South Africa has an endemic parrot, uh, the Cape parrot, that is critically endangered. And so I traveled there and wrote a story about this animal and how important it is to the ecosystem of uh, South Africa. There were a lot of people in South Africa who'd actually never heard of it, which is incredible to me. So diving back into business here, that is the II, that's a nocturnal primate in Madagascar. And when you hear people talk about species going extinct, you're more likely to hear about elephants or tigers or those charismatic animals you often see splashed on the billboards. But a lot of lesser known animals and plants and vertebrates and so-called ugly species like this guy, which is considered an evil omen by some people in Madagascar because of its appearance, are suffering in the shadows. And the problem is there's a limited pot of money that can go to these animals. This slide, it doesn't have a photo because you've all seen what a panda, tiger, elephant looks like. So you don't need to see another photo of that, but it's important to know that a lot of the decisions about conservation are made on this guttural sort of emotional level. Uh, even scientists will admit to doing that, that they wanna save the animals that have forward facing eyes that are large, that we feel like we can subconsciously relate to. But an animal that doesn't have a face, that doesn't have, an eye, that doesn't have eyes may not be as appealing to us. So that leads to an inequity and uh, an imbalance in conservation. And here's a statistic that gives you uh, an example of that. So India spent about $50 million alone on tiger conservation. And there's a threatened cactus in Texas, which gets $140,000 a year, and which scientists have told me could actually be brought back if we invested simply a few ten th tens of thousand dollars more. So there's many, many examples I could give you of these inequities in conservation that are driven largely due to whether we just like an animal. Stuart Pym is a biologist I've interviewed many times. He's well known in the field of uh, extinction and endangered species. And this is one of the favorite quotes that he's given me that very much sums up what we're talking about today. Wanted to give you a few more examples. These are all photographs that Joel Sartori has taken of creatures that are literally down to the hundreds. So I'm talking about maybe 200 left in the wild. There are some left in captivity. For example, the Adax, which is a large antelope native to the Sahara. There are 2000 of those on hunting ranches and zoos. So it's not in danger of going extinct in captivity, but there were fewer than 200 in Niger and Chad, uh, which is part of its Saharan population in the wild. Uh, the Javan slow loris, uh, no one even knows how many are left. It lives on a very populated island in Indonesia. The northern bald ibis has gotten more attention recently, uh, but it used to range throughout Europe and the Middle East. It's now extinct across the entire European continent and only exists in some parts of um, Africa and the Middle East. The Philippine crocodile is also uh, critically endangered, um, down to, I believe, to 200 or less individuals. And it's heavily threatened um, by uh, habitat destruction. So why do we care, right? That's, that's always the question that journalists uh, will ask you or any hardened news editor. Why do we publish this? Why does it matter? And I think the answer is that most animals have an, a very important role in their ecosystem that we might not even realize, especially if they're understudied. This guy doesn't have a face, <laughs> but it is a federally endangered oyster mussel. 
I'm not sure if you've heard there is uh, what many people are calling a freshwater mussel apocalypse underway currently in the United States, in the Eastern United States. Some mussel species have declined by up to 99% in parts of Virginia um, and Maryland. And a lot of that could be due to um, habitat destruction. It could be a virus, but the impact of losing that scale of freshwater mussels on water quality is probably incredible because these mussels are very much um, natural purifiers. They clean the water in ways that we don't appreciate. So what is the impact of this mussel ap apocalypse? We don't know, and it's scary. So it's really important to recognize that Many invertebrates are really important to ecosystem health. Um, and like, as we mentioned earlier, the American burying beetle is a fantastic example of that as a natural recycler. This guy is one of my favorite little creatures. It's the uh, purple frog. He's an endangered amphibian who's native to India's Western Ghats region. Uh, sometimes when you read about conservation and you talk to conservationists, they talk about something called umbrella species. And they say, well, if you save the tiger, then all of that wonderful conservation magic is going to trickle down and save all of the animals underneath. That sounds like a nice, tidy, you know, great rationale. But the problem is that it doesn't necessarily apply to every species. It's a concept that doesn't really have enough data behind it. And the reason I put a picture of this amphibian is because it lives in the tiger's habitat but it requires fast flowing streams as part of its life cycle. The tiger, however, can cope with um, not having fast flowing streams in its environment. So it has natural differences in what it requires. So the conservation plan for the tiger may not include the needs of other species below, living in the umbrella below it. So that's important to realize when you're uh, talking about conservation and focusing on these um, celebrity species or flagship species as they're called. There are many people working on trying to kind of take the emotion out of what we wanna save and focus on what can we really look at to make this more of an analytical process. And those are called decision analysis, analysis tools. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service uses something called the knapsack problem. Uh, at times. They've used it with the Ozark hellbender, which is a salamander uh, native to the United States. And that's inspired by the hikers uh, need to fit things into their backpack. So they only have a limited amount of space. So they have to really think what objects can they fit inside. And the idea is what species can you restore that is least expensive? And how many of those can you fit in the backpack without you know, having extra stuff that you can't fit. So it's it's sort of like looking at the most bang for your buck in terms of conserving species. There are other variations of this kind of decision analysis tool. There's one that looks at the species value if it has an economic value. So let's say the Atlantic salmon is extremely valuable to many economies. So that would mean that it would be weighted higher in a mathematical algorithm than say a fish that is not used in fisheries. So these kind of tools help governments and conservation groups sort of take the, the difficulty of choosing what species to save and gives them sort of a, a, a more of a you know, targeted focus. There are also scientists who say we should preserve the edge species out there. So these are the most evolutionarily unique animals, the last of their kind, um, very primitive creatures. Um, an example is the echidna, which is an egg-laying mammal in Australia. And their argument is we should save these really unusual animals that may have all kinds of benefits um, for human medicine, for understanding evolution that we're not even aware of. So that's one way of prioritizing what to save. You may have heard of conservation triage. Um, it's a controversial subject, and it's the idea that you have to let some animals go. And some people say that about pandas. Uh, I've heard that discussed. Um, you know, pandas only ovulate once a year. They can be really tough to breed. Um, they're still struggling in the wild. It's a very ethical dilemma. 
And it was actually discussed with the California condor in the 80s when the animal had declined to, I believe, less than 200 individuals in the wild. People discussed, should we just let them go extinct or should we invest you know, millions of dollars in bringing them back? The decision was made to bring those animals back into captivity. You may have seen those iconic photographs from the 90s of a puppet um, feeding the chicks. So they were raised in captivity and now they've rebounded to some degree uh, throughout the American West. So it was generally considered to be a good decision to bring back the condor, but was it at the expense of other lesser known birds that did go extinct? Those are the kinds of difficult questions and issues that we're dealing with here. Some scientists that I've spoken to, uh, especially there's one scientist at Kent University named Bob Smith, who studies something called Cinderella species. So the stepchildren <laughs> of the conservation world. Um, these are animals that are popular with the public um, and that is based on you know, survey, public surveys or looking at data from internet searches, um, but have been traditionally ignored as flagships. So some examples, are the pygmy raccoon of Cozumel, Mexico, which people probably haven't heard much about, uh, the okapi, which is this really interesting endangered creature, uh, looks like a, um, like a zebra and a giraffe mix that lives in Central Africa, and the Mandora dwarf, uh, dwarf buffalo, that is an animal that is native to the Philippines. The research that Bob Smith and other scientists have done have revealed that people would embrace these animals as flagships if given the chance. So for example, if you're driving down the highway, like I was yesterday, and you see a big sign that says, you know, please help me, please save me. And it's a big picture of an elephant. Instead, if there was a big picture of a okapi, for example, it may engender the same response and the same emotional reaction from the public. And the reason that we haven't done it is just because people have continued to rely on these charismatic megafauna. He actually did a study that found 500 potential Cinderella species around the world. So there's no shortage of these animals. It's just now incumbent upon nonprofits and uh, conservation groups and governments to adopt these animals as uh, more poster animals for conservation. I wanted to uh, also highlight some positives um, in this, in this uh, area. The Machis tree kangaroo, how could not it not be a, a poster animal, right? It's a kangaroo that lives in trees. It's super cute. It's endangered. It's native to Papua New Guinea and it's um, very often hunted for meat um, in that region. But it's also uh, a priority of National Geographic Society uh, to study the animal and there's currently a documentary underway about this creature and unlocking some of its behavior. The uh, Sunda pangolin, uh, you've probably heard about pangolins a lot more in recent years because it's the world's most illegally traded animal. Its scales are used in traditional medicines and the scale, <laughs> pun intended, of which it is hunted is absolutely uh, ast astronomical, but a lot of people don't realize there's eight species of pangolins uh, that live in Asia and Africa. So it's also important to realize there are more than, than just one. And it has gotten uh, some more attention in National Geographic magazine. We've done a feature on it. And uh, I was happy to see in my neighborhood parade last Halloween that um, kids were wearing pangolin costumes. So I felt like that was a win for <laughs> the forgotten species. And then lastly, uh, one of my pet uh, areas is wild, uh, small wild cats. So I wrote an article in the 2017 um, magazine in National Geographic about all these amazing small cats that live around the world. You know, they tend to be ignored because they look like our cats, our house cats. They're often small and brown. They don't show up very much. They're nocturnal but there's dozens of them living on almost every continent that play extremely important role as predators. There's a little one in South Africa called the black-footed cat that's uh, nicknamed the anthill tiger 
because it's so fierce. It's, it has to be because it's so tiny. And then this, this guy is the flat headed cat it has that elongated face because it fishes, you know, it, it, uh, it catches fish in wetlands in Southeast Asia. And it's also an endangered species, but I was hoping that um, with my article and uh, you know, these kind of events that people will be more appreciative of these small cats and not just the lions and the tigers and the leopards, which the big cats often get the lion's share, pun intended, of, uh, of attention. So luckily National Geographic has also been uh, exploring more content and storytelling around invertebrates. And this magazine article was our cover uh, story not too long ago in 2020. It uh, talked about the widespread loss of insects around the world, which is, um, as we talked about earlier with their benefits can be catastrophic to certain ecosystems. And then in uh, February, I wrote this story about the 11,000th species in the photo arc. And this creature is called the long-tooth long dart moth. It's kind of like, you know, if you're a birder, you know the term little brown bird. There's a lot of little brown moths out there. And this is one of them. And Joel Sartori was photographing animals along the Pecos River in New Mexico. And he found this guy and he uh, emailed a photo, I think, to a bug expert. And what the bug expert responded floored him because he wrote, I've been waiting for this photograph for 130 years. So Joel Sartori photographed the first live specimen of the species that had been recognized in the 1800s. That tells you alone how little we know about these little creatures right in our backyards. And also, you know, how many are there? Is it, is it was it a rare find? Are there hundreds of these? along that river stretch. There's a lot of questions that this kind of discovery opens up. Um, and also highlights the importance of citizen science too. And that's one of the things that I talk about a lot in my stories and with scientists is that especially now with the pandemic, we can all contribute to recognizing these unappreciated or unstudied species in our own backyards by taking photographs, just being curious, going in your backyard with a smartphone. There's so many apps right now, iNaturalist, all these ways that you can illustrate um, and capture the world around you. So that alone could find the next long tooth dart moth that's been missing for 130 years. I also wanted to share a little video clip of um, Joel Sartori at work this past summer because the pandemic uh, has also helped him focus more on the forgotten species and the invertebrates. So just wanted to share that. Sartori with National Geographic Photo Arc. Can't go anywhere because the pandemic. So we're doing insects this summer. We're starting as soon as it warmed up in May, all the way till frost. But Lots and lots of insects, hundreds of species, because invertebrates help make the world go around, and we haven't gotten too many of them in the photo arc until the summer. So we're trying to do what we can during the pandemic to find a silver lining. My daughter Ellen's been helping me also, which is really nice. Tonight we're at Indian Cave State Park in Nebraska, and it's a fabulous place, like many Nebraska state parks, for insect diversity. No chemical use here, no agriculture here. It's just big rolling river bluffs along the Missouri River. And we've set up our sheets with our big lights. We're going to fire up the generators and we'll see what we get. So our process here is we string out white sheets on the ground on light stands. And then when it gets dark enough, any minute now, we'll fire up portable generators and we'll run these 250 watt bulbs and we'll run them for a couple, three hours and we'll see what comes in. Now, if something new comes in, great. We'll catch that, put it in a cup, photograph it, and let it go. And today, we've probably got about 500 species just since May. It's late August. So we're, we're rolling along. We'll get as much as we can here in Nebraska until frost comes sometime in October. So that gives you an idea of how the pandemic has 
influenced a lot of people, not just photographers, but all of us to uh, pay more attention to what's around us just in our own backyard. So in closing, I wanna make sure that everyone doesn't feel guilty for loving charismatic megafauna. That's totally okay. What I'm hoping that you take away from this presentation is it's important to realize the wealth and diversity of species that we have around the world that also need attention. Um, and that uh, through my reporting, hopefully these animals will get some more um, love and attention. I also wanted to add that I have an essay on this subject uh, publishing in the May issue of National Geographic. So I hope that you'll uh, pick up that issue and read a little bit more about this uh, concept. And if you wanna read more of our journalism, you know, we publish stories every day on uh, the animal's desk. So the link is down um, on the slide. And we have a fantastic newsletter as well uh, that illustrates a lot of the storytelling that we do. So, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Christine. That's so much great information. I, I just uh, want to get some popcorn and listen more uh, about more species that I know you could share uh, with us about. And I, I think, I hope that inspired uh, our, our uh, members here to uh, be more observant, uh, the species around them and, the, and like you're saying, the little brown birds and the little brown moths, uh, what value they do bring and, um, and how important they are to the ecosystem. So thank you so much uh, for, for that. And, you know, one question, I don't know, uh, and again, if you have questions for our speakers, uh, please, um, please share those in the chat with Teresa. But I, I do have this question, you know, the status of extinction. Uh, of course, we keep hearing, you know, one of the ones that we track is, um, you know, the monarch uh, butterfly. Um, but there are, you know, definitely we see an increase in that, or you hear some good stories about a species that they thought was extinct and they've, now they see it in and, and the wild. So I, I don't know if you could kind of give our guests an idea of um, the status of kind of the pulse of, of extinction in the world. It's also a controversial subject because <laughs> um, there's, there's a background rate of extinction. So extinction is a natural process in, in natural selection, uh, but there's no question that humans are accelerating that background rate of extinction. By how much we're accelerating it is the sticking point. So various scientists have, will say, you know, really, really high estimates. Others will say low estimates. So it, it's really, uh, I don't think there's a, a scientific consensus about it, but there is a definite uh, consensus that humans are accelerating it, um, especially due to deforestation. And you may notice a lot of the species I highlighted in the presentation uh, live in Southeast Asia, which has one of the highest deforestation rates in the world. So there's no doubt that they're going more extinct than a lot of the other uh, creatures out there. And the statistic from the IUCN that 35,000 animals are near extinction, that is by far an underestimate because those are just the animals that we've cataloged. Um, think about all the other little brown moths out there that we haven't and are no doubt uh, also close to extinction. Thank you uh, for that. Um, uh, one of the questions in the chat is to ask you what your favorite animal uh, that you've written about. Oh, well, that's, that's pretty easy. Uh, I would say the dung beetle. <laughs> um, when I first started writing about invertebrates, I had no idea we had dung beetles here in the US. I imagine there's some in Oklahoma as well. But uh, I find so fascinating is that they can orient themselves um, by the Milky Way because they can see an in infrared. So they can turn their little dung balls around depending on where the Milky Way is in the sky. And so the fact that such a simple creature can have such an advanced ability to navigate to me just blows my mind and shows that um, we should really respect these animals more than we do. Thank you. And that question actually came from Ann Money and a shout out to Ann Money for connecting us with you. So um, uh, appreciate uh, Ann making that. So um, are there any other questions for uh, Brad or Christine? I know it's a, it's a lot to take in, and, but are there any questions that you might have? 
Okay, well, um, we are, well, uh, we are close uh, to the end here, but uh, again, um, and oh, and Rick wanted me to, Rick Kutarski with the zoo wanted to point out that um, uh, the photographer uh, at, uh, did come to Tulsa to take some pictures. Uh, and so we were a part of that. So uh, thank you. And uh, again, I want to thank Christine and Brad for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And uh, we have one last poll, Megan's out there. So before you log off, just take a moment uh, to answer that poll again. It, it helps us uh, make this, these programs better for you. So uh, we'll also uh, be sending out an email tomorrow to you all, and it contains today recording as well as links and resources discussed today during the event. So uh, look for that in your email uh, tomorrow. And um, uh, while you're answering these poll questions, I wanted to let you know that April's Sustainability Challenge is reducing your carbon footprint. Uh, so you can do that by, you know, taking a bike ride instead of your car or walking instead of your car. Uh, but one other thing you can do is to purchase offsets is one thing. And the reason I bring that up is because of the program uh, and the project that we are um, uh, a part of right now, which is uh, commemorating lives lost uh, to the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. So uh, purchase a tree, be a part of that, make that your uh, sustainability challenge or a portion uh, or, or a share of a tree. We'll share that link in there again um, and share that out with folks that you think might want to also be a part of that. Um, also, uh, you know, again, uh, feel free to support uh, us with a $5 help to continue our first Thursday program. We do appreciate that support today and help us continue the program so that we are uh, sharing with you. Um, Teresa will put the link of our Facebook uh, group chat again in, uh, in the chat there, the Facebook group link. So if you want to be a part of that, it's a great way to connect with ideas and recommendations and share what you've learned along the way around sustainability. So uh, please join us there. Again, thank you to our sponsors, our lead sponsor, Williams, our neighborhood partners, Public Service Company of Oklahoma and PSO Wind Choice, our community advocates, American Waste Control, Cavanta, The Met, One Oak, Save Our Streams, Spirit Era Systems, and uh, our newest uh, sponsor, Tulsa Farmers Market. We look forward to seeing you next month on Thursday, May 6th. So, uh, but so many great things happening during Earth Month. So uh, definitely check those out, get involved. And again, thank you. Give a virtual uh, round of applause again to Christine and uh, Brad. Thank you both for joining us today. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, have a great rest of the day. Uh, again, we look forward to seeing you on May 6th. Thank you. Take care.